Due to geography, there weren't many joint British-Soviet operations during World War II, but one of major significance did occur in a nation much in the news at the moment, the invasion of Iran. Persia, as the country of Iran was traditionally known for centuries, had really emerged as a modern state in 1925, when an Iranian military officer named Reza Khan managed to unify the country under his rule, and who subsequently declared himself the Shah of Iran, a Shah being equivalent to an emperor, and Iran the name used by locals for the territory of Persia. The previous royal dynasty had left Iran weak, divided and poor, and Reza Shah began an ambitious program of industrialization and military and cultural modernizations. He built schools and infrastructure, modernized the ancient cities and knitted Iran together with road and railway networks. Importantly, on the international stage, Reza Shah kept Iran neutral, but also maintained fairly friendly relations with the Western powers, powers that provided the loans he needed to modernize Iran. Britain in particular had substantial financial interests in Iran and the wider Middle East, and owned the Anglo-Iranian oil company and its strategically important Abadan refinery. This oil vital to the Royal Navy's huge fleet of oil-fired warships, and also to the wider British economy, and after September 1939, to the Allied war effort against Nazi Germany. The Germans also knew the value of Iranian oil to the war effort, and by 1940, British Empire forces were fighting Germany's ally, Italy, in North Africa and also in East Africa. The French colonies in the Middle East supported the collaborationist Vichy regime following France's capitulation in summer 1940, a threat to the British position in Palestine and the eastern Mediterranean. The fear was German access to the Persian Gulf. Iran bordered the Soviet Union to the north, and Stalin's non-aggression pact with Hitler further alarmed the British. Iran also bordered Iraq, a de facto part of the British Empire, but somewhere with a strong pro-Nazi camp that would, in early 1941, actually overthrow the Prince Regent, Prince Abdal Illa, and form an outright pro-Nazi government. Relations between Reza Shah and the British had been rocky on and off. In the 1930s, Reza had accused the Anglo-Iranian oil company of financial malpractices that had hurt Iranians, leaving it with only 16% of the net profit from the nation's oil industry. He had won some concessions from the company, but the negotiations had left the British with the impression that Reza was hostile to its own oil interests. With the German invasion of the Soviet Union in June 1941, the USSR joined Britain as an ally. By now, Rommel's Africa Corps had begun a series of stunning victories with the Italians in North Africa, with the intention of occupying Egypt, cutting the Suez Canal, and joining up with Hitler's forces in the Soviet Union that were pushing into the Caucasus, and perhaps were headed for Iran and eventually the Persian Gulf. The Western Allies were very busy supplying Stalin with Lend-Lease material, military equipment and supplies to keep him in the war, and the easiest way was to send it through the so-called Persian Corridor via the Trans-Iranian Railway. The railway now became an extremely important focus point for the Allies. It had to be maintained at all costs, and leaving it in Reza Shah's hands seemed unwise. The other way the Soviet Union was being supplied was by the Arctic convoys, but these were of course very vulnerable to U-boat attacks. In Iraq, the short-lived pro-Nazi government had been crushed during the short war between Iraq and the British in May 1941 that had seen the re-imposition of a pro-British government in Baghdad. Iran now began to experience anti-British demonstrations in Tehran as Britain and the USSR pressured the Iranian government over the vital railway link. Iran's geographical position threatened both allied nations, the British because if a German force managed to invade Iran by advancing southeast from the Caucasus, British communications between India and the Mediterranean would be threatened, not to mention the oil supplies. 
Stalin was concerned about a German advance into Iran threatening the Soviet Caucasus oil fields and the rear of his armies trying to fend off the Germans. The British labelled the Tehran protests pro-German. Between July and August 1941, the British demanded that Reza Shah throw out all German nationals in Iran, up to 3,000 people, which the Shah refused to do. This was because many Germans were vital workers in Iran's transportation and communications networks. Reza Shah still wanted to remain neutral, but because of the recent Anglo-Iraq war, large British military forces sat just across the border. The decision was taken by Britain and the Soviet Union to jointly invade Iran to topple Reza Shah's government and put someone more amenable to Allied interests in charge, thereby securing Stalin's supply conduit to the British and still neutral Americans, and securing the oil for the Allies. It was a classic example of regime change, something we have all become familiar with in recent times. The invasion was not, however, unexpected by the Iranians, though their military preparations were very patchy. The plan was simple. Royal Navy and Royal Australian Navy vessels would attack from the Persian Gulf, while British Empire troops invaded overland from Iraq. The Soviets would also cross the border from an area called Transcaucasia, or South Caucasus. Commanding the British forces was Lieutenant General Edward Quinnan, who had commanded the invasion of Iraq. His ground forces consisted of the 8th and 10th Indian Infantry Divisions, the 2nd Indian Armoured Brigade, the 4th British Cavalry Brigade, and the 21st Indian Infantry Brigade. Though these units are called Indian, it must be remembered that at least a third of all the troops in each of these units were in fact British battalions, which was always the case in the Indian Army throughout World War II. The Soviets deployed the 44th, 47th, and 53rd Armies, majority of infantry divisions supported by some 1,000 T-26 tanks. The British, of course, also deployed some light tanks and armoured cars with their cavalry brigades. Facing the Allies was the Imperial Iranian Army, numbering nine divisions, two of which were armoured. The armour consisted of a hundred FT-6 and CKD TNH light tanks, and some AH-4 tankettes and French armoured cars. The Army's standard infantry firearm was the Czech VZ-24 rifle, a version of the German Mauser Gewehr 98. There were also some ZB VZ-30 and ZB-53 machine guns, and some artillery. The Imperial Iranian Air Force was a fairly antiquated affair, primarily consisting of British Hawker Fury fighters and Hawker Hart bombers, some French biplanes and Soviet-made copies of the British DH-4 and DH-9A. Modern RAF aircraft struck from Iraq on the 25th of August 1941, the date of the joint invasion, bombing targets in Tehran and elsewhere, and dropping leaflets urging surrender. Soviet planes also bombed cities, such as Tabriz and Ardabil. Hundreds of civilians were killed in these raids. Iranian military command wanted to blow up bridges, roads and so on to impede the Allied advance, but the Shah refused, understandably as he had spent years slowly building this infrastructure, though this was a mistake militarily. A Royal Navy task force attacked on the 25th of August, HMS Shoreham sinking by gunfire an Iranian sloop at Abadan. Almost the entire Iranian tank force and 27,000 troops defended Khuzestan, the region that was vital to the Iranian oil industry. British troops landed, and some heavy fighting occurred which resulted in British and Indian casualties. The Australian crewed Kanimbla landed two battalions of troops at Bandar Shapur, seizing seven German and Italian merchant ships, an eighth being scuttled to prevent its capture. The naval base fell after very heavy fighting. HMAS Yara sank an Iranian sloop in the docks at Karam Shah, and the head of the Imperial Iranian Navy was killed in action. 
the RAF struck at Iranian airfields, quickly gaining air superiority. Advancing from Basra in Iraq, the 8th Indian Infantry Division captured Khaza Sheikh on the 25th of August and then the city of Karam Shah. Some fighting occurred, but the Shat al Arab waterway was soon in British hands. By early on the 27th of August, British troops reached Arvag, where Iranian infantry with artillery and some tanks were heavily dug in. The initial Anglo Indian attack on Arvaz was repulsed by the Iranians. On the 29th of August, word of a ceasefire reached the Iranian troops. The British decided to leave the Iranians in their positions, but post British troops alongside of them. In return, the Iranians were to hand over British nationals from the city. Whilst this was going on in the south, in central Iran, Major General William Slim, later famous for his activities in Burma against the Japanese, commanding the 10th Indian Infantry Division, attacked. The 10th struck across the frontier at the Iraqi town of Kanakin, 100 miles northeast of Baghdad. The 10th reached the Iranian Naftishar oil fields without difficulty, though RAF and Iranian fighters did engage in dogfights overhead, the RAF shooting down six Iranian planes for no loss. On the 28th of August, British forces entered Shahabad, defended by some light infantry and artillery. But due to the ceasefire next day, the next city, Kermanshah, was declared an open city and was occupied by the British without resistance on the 1st of September. Northwest Iran was struck by the Red Army invasion on the 25th of August, with three armoured spearheads for a total of a thousand tanks moving in. The city of Jolfa was quickly taken. The Iranians failed to counterattack, and Iranian forces in the region were either cut off and bypassed or fell into bits. Some heavy resistance was encountered, but by the 26th of August, the Soviets controlled all of Iranian Azerbaijan. The Soviet Caspian Sea flotilla attacked, and the 44th Army assaulted by land, using the Astara Highway to advance inland. At Pahlavi Harbour, the Iranians fought desperately and stopped the Soviets from actually landing. The following day, the Soviets started heavy aerial bombing, destroying many Iranian positions, as well as killing over 200 civilians. The Iranian defences were certainly very stiff, and the Soviets took significant casualties getting through them, but without tanks and aircraft, the outcome for the Iranians was inevitable, and most surrendered on the 28th of August. Simultaneously, a second Soviet attack occurred from Iranian Azerbaijan moving south. The 47th Army captured Dilmun and then Ermia. Meanwhile, the 53rd Army moved south, eventually moving on Tehran on the 28th of August. On the 29th, Soviet armoured spearheads reached Kazvin, 94 miles from the Iranian capital, then took Saveh and Qom south of Tehran, cutting the country in two. Following the ceasefire, the Red Army entered Tehran, declared an open city on the 30th of August. The last Soviet operation of the 25th of August was in northeastern Iran, invading from Soviet Turkmenistan. The Soviet invasion there was completely successful. By the 29th of August 1941, Iran was in chaos. The royal family, except the Shah and the Crown Prince, had fled from Tehran. The relatively easy collapse of the carefully built-up Imperial Iranian army was a national humiliation. The Shah was so incensed by the army's poor performance that he physically assaulted the head of the army and demoted him on the spot. The Shah blamed his Prime Minister, Ali Mansour, for the disaster and forced his resignation. The new Prime Minister, Mohammad Ali Farugi, told the British that the Iranians wanted to be liberated from the Shah's rule. The British demanded that in return for Allied withdrawal from the country, the Shah had to agree to hand over all German and Axis nationals, including their families, to the British and the Soviets, the latter of course to probable maltreatment. Reza Shah delayed this action long enough that most of the German nationals managed to escape to neutral Turkey instead. In response to the Shah's actions, Stalin ordered the full occupation of Tehran, triggering a wave of refugees from the city, including all of those with any money. 
Reza Shah announced his abdication on the 17th of September as the Red Army began to move into Tehran. The regime change part of the Allied plan was now enacted. The British favoured restoration of the previous royal dynasty to the throne, as they had largely done what the British had told them to do. But the problem was that the heir was a British citizen and couldn't even speak Persian. The decision was therefore taken to place Reza Shah's son, Crown Prince Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, on the throne as Shah. Reza Shah was arrested and died in South Africa in 1944. On the 17th of October 1941, the Allies withdrew from Tehran, and Britain and the USSR partitioned Iran between them until 1945, ensuring the Persian Corridor remained open to supply the USSR with vital lend-lease material. At the September 1943 Tehran Conference, Prime Minister Winston Churchill, Marshal Stalin and President Franklin D. Roosevelt were committed to Iranian independence and Iran became an allied nation and would actually benefit from American Lend-Lease. However, the results of the war for ordinary Iranians were initially somewhat dire. There were food shortages that caused widespread suffering and famine. The occupying Allied troops requisitioned much of the grain in the country and also used much of the transportation system. Bread riots occurred in Tehran in 1942, resulting in deaths. Inflation stood at 450%. In 1943, 30,000 US troops arrived to help man the Persian Corridor. The US, as I mentioned, extended Lend-Lease to Iran, an American was even appointed Iranian finance minister to try to sort out the economy. In March 1946, the British began to withdraw from Iran, followed very reluctantly by the Soviet Union in May. Mohammad Reza Pahlavi ruled as Shah of Iran until 1979. In 1953, the Shah's democratically elected Prime Minister, Mohammad Mossadegh, was overthrown after he had nationalised the British-owned oil industry in order to financially benefit his own country. The 1953 coup was carried out on the surface by the Iranian military, but with the direct involvement of both MI6 and CIA. The Shah was then given ultimate power in the country. However, in 1979, the Islamic Revolution broke out in Iran, and the Shah fled into exile in Egypt, where he died in 1980 in Cairo at the age of 60. Since 1979, Iran has been ruled as the Islamic Republic of Iran. Many thanks for watching. Please subscribe and share, and also visit my audiobook channel, War Stories with Mark Felton. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon. Details in the description box below.